Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. Um, so what I will be saying is partially based on a, on a review I wrote with Danielson, uh, where we also make a, well, suggest that the possible conjecture that the sitter space cannot arise in string theory is actually not that bizarre. Um, there is a complementary review by Tom Banks with the amusing title, 10 to the 500 reasons not to believe in the landscape, uh, which has very different things, so it, it's also an interesting uh, review. But that's not a review about KKLT. Um, and I wrote 20%, 25% of what I'm saying is, only, is my work. Okay, so if I don't answer all questions correct, let's, let's blame it on that. And before we go into the details, I want to make some general remarks. Right. So the most conservative attitude towards dark energy is to say that it's given by a cosmological constant, which is tiny and positive. And this poses two problems, right? So if lambda is small and greater than zero, the smallness is a problem already in quantum field theory, whereas the positivity is a problem within string theory. Um, and the reason, let me just remind you because I need it later on, the reason why it's a problem in quantum field theory is because the vacuum energy is a dimension four operator given by this. And so whenever there is a particle in the UV that we don't know of because we integrated it out, nonetheless, it contributes the following term to the um, vacuum energy. Right? This is the famous UV sensitivity um, of the of vacuum energy. Um, and that is, well, that's a real problem why it's, it's small. Uh, what, so it's a real problem that it's small. Um, so what is the attitude in string theory? So what we do in string theory is we don't compute these kind of things. What we're doing is we're trying to look for weakly coupled space-time solutions, which have the following structure. I'm ignoring warping. So there's a four-dimensional piece, which we say is the sitter, or we look for a four-dimensional piece that is a sitter, yeah, DS and DS, twice, twice the same symbol, but I guess you know what I'm saying. And this, the most conservative approach, is that this is a compact manifold. And what counts for what I'm saying now, and which is not sufficiently emphasized in the literature, the length scale we associate with a four-dimensional piece is the Hubble scale. Let me call it L lambda. And the length scale here we call LKK, Kaluza Klein. Okay, so what do we mean by the word landscape? So the landscape is a set of all solutions in string theory which obeys the following condition, L lambda over LKK is parametrically large. Okay, I mean this is terminology. I wouldn't, for instance, call ADS5 cross S5 something in the landscape. Why? It's not a lower dimensional solution. Okay, it's a 10 dimensional solution. So this is just to set my terminology. But what I find Interesting and surprisingly, I don't understand why this is not emphasized. So this condition is necessary in order to use four-dimensional effective field theory. If you don't obey that condition, you, you cannot use four-dimensional effective field theory to describe and understand your vacuum. Okay, but you see, there is a problem of a circle of reasoning. The CC problem only arises in, arises in 4D QFT. Right? But the condition in string theory to, uh, that allows you to use 4D QFT is only okay if L lambda over LKK is huge. But let me rewrite this, and then you get my point. In terms of mass scales, it means that the mass scale that I associate to the dark energy in KK units is super tiny. Only then I am allowed to use four-dimensional effective field theory. And that's a statement in string theory or any theory with extra dimensions. But you see the circle? In order to allow, that I'm allowed to use 4D QFT, I have to start 
with a cosmological constant problem. Okay? And I don't know why this is not more emphasized, but what I like about this observation is the following, and then I go to KKLT, I just needed to say this. Um, imagine that somehow we find a dynamical, sorry, dynamical compactification reason. Maybe this is not good language. What I mean is um, maybe there's a, so our attitude in string theory is just listing solutions of this kind. We don't ask ourselves how do we get there, okay? But you have to. There must be early universe dynamics which sort of says where you can end up, okay? But imagine there's a dynamical reason for why four dimensions grow large and six dimensions are small. If that dynamical reason is there, imagine it's string gas cosmology, then we solve the CC problem, okay? That's a statement I wanted to make. Why is there a circle? It's true what you said, but why is there a circular argument? I don't understand. Well, the only circular argument is that we are talking about the CC problem, but the CC problem you can only discuss in 4D QFT, and the only the condition that allows you to use 4D QFT is by input that the CC is very tiny. So you cannot, within a string theory context, claim that oh, you know there is a CC problem because I have to put it in as a condition to allow me to derive it. You're saying that in pure theory, there is no CC problem because uh, I can normalize the CC. That's a well known statement. That's okay. Pure theories don't have a CC problem. Yeah, they don't couple to gravity. I mean, I, I don't yeah. care. Yeah. But only we have a CC problem. There are, of course, extremes of the question, right? We can have, you know, uh, scale of the MKK could be huge, near the God scale or something like that, and lambda could be, you know, GV or something like that. Okay. That would have been still okay in your language. Yep. That's not what's called okay. No, I'm taking it parametric. But there is a CC problem even, even if you take that. In other words, you can say there's a minor CC problem, but there is a, in that sense. Well, you have to put in the numbers. I guess I have to put in the numbers, right? But usually. The most naive thing is that you would say, well, there are two scales, the God scale and the weak scale. Why isn't the cosmological constant the weak scale? That's the, okay. That, that would certainly be a reasonable string wave version of that question. Let's say the most conservative attitude is say the question, why Lana? divided by lambda new physics, why that is so small. And let me call new physics the KK scale. I mean, I understand also what you're saying, right? Maybe I take it too far, but nonetheless, I think it's correct. Um, all right, so, yeah. But I can, uh, I can use 4D QFT above the KK scale. So I can violate your uh, problem, or avoid your problem, because if I have the full KK tower, I can keep the primitive QFT significantly above the KK scale. And then there is a CC problem in field theory, even though lambda is small. But I don't disagree that there's a CC problem in field theory. I don't, okay, I don't see the circle. I, I see, I, I'm claiming that I can, I can be specific about the CC problem, mm -hmm. even in a case Although M lambda is smaller than, M, than MKK, okay. because you can use four defective field theory far above the KK scale, as long as I sum all the. Right. Okay. Maybe we should discuss afterwards. I need to think about this. Um, the only other small remark, which I think is, can be useful, but again, this, I'm not an expert in this. We don't fully understand uh, the RG scale um, for the cosmological constant. I think it's an open problem how to interpret it. If it's really there, you might be saying that the CC is running. Um, what does that mean? I also don't think that that's really understood. And this actually might relate to the work on quantum IR backreaction of Polyakov, Motala, Woodard, many others. And I don't think this should be ignored in the current discussion about the De Sitter swamp plant. But I'll come back to that. So let me go as fast as I can to KKLT. And then I have to, for that, I make my last general remark. So we're not computing loop corrections or whatsoever in string theory, nonetheless, we claim that we can compute vacuum energies. And then you have to ask yourself, how can that be? And the reason is we are doing something very special in string theory. We don't just write down any solution. When you look at string moduli space, and let me take a two-dimensional slice, 
where one direction is given by the string coupling, the other direction is given by the inverse volume, which are, you know, both of them are moduli. Okay, what we are doing is we are investigating string theory exactly at this point, and we go a little bit around that point. All right? But that point is special. Why is it special? It implies that if I, you know, do a flux compactification, I can claim that lambda is a minimum of my effective potential. And by effective potential, I mean, you know, the classical flux piece plus some leading order quantum corrections that we typically use. That's, so what I'm saying is that really your classical effective action with this effective potential, the minimum of the potential, which you should call the classical CC, is in fact the real CC. And that is because we're doing this weird thing. Okay, and that's the beauty of working with the UV complete theory, that we have a control over the UV corrections. Okay, and I also wanted to make that statement because it's surprising if we discuss amongst, you know, people working on fluxes and you ask a question, you know, is your potential and the minimum, is it a bare classical CC or is it a full? And then there's usually a big confusion. And I think that is what's going on. Okay, so let me go to KKLT, given these general remarks, and I'm first going to quickly review it. I'm afraid many of you know it, but for those that don't know it by heart, it's probably good to remind yourself. So, and I will review. Well, so I didn't quite understand the remark here. So, yeah. suppose we are at the weak cut in the string. Yeah. There's still the correction that you write down as part of string computation. You do, you do get Oh, totally. So, what I'm saying is that these corrections are there. And usually, what we say in effective field theory is there must be some magical cancellation be between all the higher order corrections for them to have an unnatural value. And I'm saying that magic. We, we make happen. Why do we make it happen? By putting ourselves in a very unnatural point of string moduli space. In the generic case... So it wouldn't be the magic happen. I mean, we, we have to compute that maybe it, one loop might destroy, but magic we find in GN0, for example. So you're saying if I compute KKLT? So can I make a, an, 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 a, a thought experiment? So usually method loops, we say back -react on the Cosmos constant, okay? And I have an example where it's true, but in the way we do the computations, you don't have to calculate that. And maybe I'm wrong, but here is a suggestion. So imagine, so the pure KKLT scenario, we don't look at standard model, etc., right? But imagine I want to engineer the standard model. I want to engineer flavors, etc. that will back -react. How do we do it? <clears throat> we put in a stack of seven brains, try to do a lot of tricks to get, you know, gauge groups. But what happens when you do that, you're actually destabilizing your original vacuum. You have to recalculate using the Einstein equations, using the full you know, ten-dimensional supergravity, where your new minimum is. What? And that to me, so that I'm doing that classically. Well, you have to, you have, one have to be careful. So suppose you start with a supersymmetric situation. In that context, you know that that reaction will be irrelevant because these cancel in pairs. Right. So you can start there, and that will be fine. You can ignore the one loop because you know it's not going to affect you. And then as soon as you as soon as you mess that up, then you're open to criticism. What happened to your things? You have to argue that this splitting of the bosons, fermions, right. which will destroy that will not affect your answer. And it might. So there's I don't think there's any But imagine it might. Then I don't fully understand why we're debating KKLT, because you get a classical well classical you have some leading quantum corrections. You get a, a positive CC, but if it then get can renormalized, oh, that's, that's then it can be any sign of the CC and we don't know. Well, I'm thinking that the reason we believe that KKLT spits out a positive CC might be related to this, that we actually have a control over all the corrections from the UV point of view, and the corrections are in GS, they're in alpha prime, and by being here, I suppress all of these. And well, this is why I trust... Is a lot of magic, but it's not inconsistent with field theory. No, no, th I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that all of those corrections... And I agree, but I'm saying they cancel, and that's why we trust the leading supergravity... So, I mean, I'll give you one example. Just the hydraulic O16 cross O16 string. <laughs> right. That one has zero cosmological constant at three levels, but developed cosmological constant at one loop, and be exactly because of those effects. Right. That and is. We can compute it and we computed it. But that's a so CC in 10 dimensions. I'm just giving yeah. you an example. So, a string theory is a perfectly computable scheme in that context. Right. We did compute it. Did contribute it. It didn't give you anything or zero. It was UV complete. Theory. Right. It was an answer. Right. You cannot say that. There's no such thing in a different background. In a different background, we have a similar situation. Right. Maybe, we can, we yeah. That, that's an Nonetheless, I try to defend why the answer you get from this typical uh, framework where you put fluxes 
leading order quantum corrections, why we trust that that's actually the real CC that we compute. That's the thing I wanted to defend. So, I mean, aren't you just saying, maybe I'm misunderstanding, that since you're in weak coupling, the higher order effects are small? Exactly, because I have the UV theory, I know how it goes in the UV theory, and there it goes with GS and alpha prime, fine, and this should be... Fine. And that's a claim of KKLT and many other papers. If you find that lambda is like 10 to the minus 100, and then your one loop is just one tenth or 100, that would affect it. That, then you're, you're, you're at the mercy of that correction. So, so it's not every leading thing in terms of relevant thing. Well, if your T-string is small enough. If it's 10 to the minus 100, yes. No, I don't think that's what he's going to be doing. <laughs> Isn't the distinction between whether the supersymmetry is I mean, in the... Scale of Susie breaking. Yeah. In the example someone mentioned, there's no supersymmetry at any scale, so you have a, a logical constant. But I'm not sure that's correct, because imagine I break supersymmetry at the KK scale, but I still have a weakly coupled... The L16 model has no supersymmetry. Right, right, right. But imagine I do, and I construct a weakly coupled space-time solution. Just like the way we construct non-extremal black holes in string theory, you sort of trust your space-time solution up to you know, very tiny scales. So if the curvature of that solution has a certain value, I call that a CC, and I trust it the moment it's weakly coupled in string theory. And I don't expect corrections from the SUSY breaking scale. Wait, but why not? Because I'm at weak coupling in, in string theory. You're just saying that because you don't need cutoffs, you're not going exactly. to Right. But I don't disagree with effective field theory. I'm just saying the tower of corrections somehow will roughly cancel out. That's all I'm saying. Um, so let me start with GKP. Let me do it a tiny bit different from other presentations so that it's super quick, but it gets the main point. So what am I doing? I'm at, in type 2B, and I'm for simplicity, I, simplicity, I, simplicity, I will look at uh, O3 and D3 sources. right? And then we have three form fluxes at our disposal, and we're going to make a standard compactification. And like Fernando, I'm going to, for now, ignore warping. OK? So what is my scalar potential? If you just do a KK reduction, it's this. It's an integral over the compact manifold of the fluxes involved. They come with positive energies. And the, other, the only other contribution to the energy is the tension of these guys. Okay? So this comes from the DBI term, which couples to the metric. And that term, in my notation, is written like this. So mu3 is the tension in string units. I divide by volume 6 for simplicity because I want to put it in the integral. And here I get a volume 6 vector. Okay? So what is the main idea now? of GKP, well, you realize that these guys are BPS objects, and therefore they obey this relation. OK? This is their charge. Mu3 is their tension. And then you use the ramon ramon tetpole condition. And the ramon ramon tetpole condition tells you that Q3 equals H3 wedge F3. And then comes the big trick. I replace this guy by this, by this, I put it back in here, and I see that there's some magic going on. Now, what is the magic? The potential becomes a total sum of squares. And I'm not going to get my pluses and minuses correct, but I don't care. That's beside the point. OK, this is a three-form squared. So you see, it's manifestly semi-positive definite. OK, so when can I get a vacuum? I only can get a vacuum at this level when this guy equals 0. And that is a famous ISD condition. So this is how you derive it very, very quick. Imagine yourself the dual condition. Okay. So this gives me, at the tree level in string theory, gives me a Minkowski solution. So if we want it to be, oh, and by the way, if I go back here, I plug in this condition, the ISD condition, I get that this is minus, sorry, if I do it for mu3, I get it is minus this integral. So it's explicitly negative. So what is the idea of GKP on the intuitive level? The negative energy in the orientifolds exactly cancels the positive energy in the fluxes. OK, exactly. And it had to be because of Maldacena Nunez. Otherwise, we could not get a Minkowski vacuum. All right. Um, 
So what's the next step? So to see whether this is consistent with supersymmetry uh, to some level, because then we can use four-dimensional uh, supergravity, and we have more control over the setup. And what Das Kupta et al. already realized a long time ago is that this thing is supersymmetric. So this is Susie on the condition that M6 is a Calabiao, of course, a warp Calabiao, a conformal Calabiao, if you do it correctly. And G3 has to satisfy the condition that it's 2,1 and primitive. OK, this is the complexity type, comma 1, all right? Um, but already this condition is sufficient for there to exist an n equal 1, d equal 4 description. And then whether or not you obey this is whether or not you break supersymmetry also in the supergravity in four dimensions. Um, the superpotential that describes this thing is written down by Guko Fafa Witten and has this form, all right? And I don't need the details of the killer potential. What I, the only thing I need is a following observation now. Observation one is that the derivative with respect to the killer moduli of W is zero. It doesn't depend on it. There's no J here. Second observation is that the killer potential, if I look at its properties, it obeys this condition. So if I write down my full F term scalar potential, there's a surprise happening. This thing exactly cancels the 3 W squared, so that the resulting F term potential is simply e to the k. And then, here is the thing, you get a new sum of squares. But of course, this is the exactly same sum of squares that we had before. So in my notation, if you want to understand it, alpha and beta are killer directions. I and J are complex structure directions. So again, I have a sum of squares. It's strictly positive. But that's, we already did that from the KK point of view. Yeah. No, no. I'm not yet uh, enforcing that uh, J is of this type. A G is of that type. I'm just saying I'm going to take any ISD tree form flux and. Yeah, so supersymmetry, SUSY of the solution, not of the Lagrangian, implies that W equals zero. That's all I'm saying. But then you use, I don't understand your logic. But this is just a no-scale potential that you derive. And the, the way it comes about is because the minus 3 W term, squared term, cancels against this term, which is the only guy there because this is what is happening. When you say Zuzi, you mean Zuzi of the... Uh, Manifold. <laughs> of the you are, you are in a no-scale situation, right? Yeah. No-scale Yeah. Well, it breaks Zuzi. If this, is, if this is true, or in other words, if I don't you know, obey my, uh, I, I also have to enforce this, which in the end becomes equivalent to this. I'm just confused by this line G3 is 2,1. I think we should allow for G3 to have a Of course. But the words that I added to when I was writing that okay. were important. Yeah. Right. In fact, that's what you need for KKLT, which I do now. So the point of KKLT was then this, he said, OK, maybe if you break supersymmetry by fluxes, at three level, this thing gets corrected. Um, and the way it gets corrected by non renormalization theorems, either perturbative corrections to the killer potential or non perturbative to the superpotential. And what KKLT looked at is a latter case. So they said, well, W will be W naught which is the thing that is non-zero when there are 3,0 pieces. Um, and then the extra bit that I get is this. And this is only true in the case of a single, let me call it lambda to the third, and explain these symbols. OK, so what, am I, what did I write down? First of all, there is a number t here. 
It's a modulus, and I'm just like KKLT, um, for simplicity, assuming that I have a single killer, Calabial. OK? So just to simplify life, then this is a non-perturbative correction, which in the case n equal 1, so n is an integer, you should really think of it as an E3 Euclidean tree ring in Santon. But when n is bigger than 1, you could call them fractional instantons. What they are, this is just Gagino condensation on a stack of seven brains that is wrapping uh, a four cycle, the only one. And then its gauge coupling is proportional to this scalar um, mode. And therefore, you get this term just from, for, from Gagino condensation. Um, OK, so there's an SUN, super AR mills by reducing the Armil's theory, leaving on seven brains to four. And it confines, and this is why you get that effect. All right, so if you analyze that, and you plot a potential, or you just look at the, at the F-term equations, then there's a very nice property, which classical flux compactifications never have. So here is my potential. for let, I'm plotting the real part of the imaginary part of T, which is the volume. Okay. And then it has this structure. So this is a SUSY ADS. And in fact, it obeys rough, well, you could call it scale separated. It has this property. So I think this was the first time in string theory where we had uh, a moduli stabilization scenario which was able to achieve this. I hope I'm not mistaken, but this is how this is one of the beauties of KKLT. I mean, people always quote it for the sitter, but really one of the amazing things was this. Um, oh yeah, just that we are. This comes back later. So the imaginary part of this guy is the volume of the manifold. The real part of that guy is the C4 axion, and it comes it plays a role later on when we discuss the weak gravity conjecture. All right, the last step of KKLT will be the one I will be scrutinizing. This is beyond my, I mean, this is, you can scrutinize this. Actually, I also come back to it. But this is much more complicated. OK, the last step is a famous D3 bar uplifting. OK, so what's the ID here? I'm going to be very sketchy because I'm going to give you more details later on. You say, OK, what if we can find single killer calabiaus or more general? if we have a more general moduli stabilization scenario, which have the property that they have highly warped throats, okay? which is not unlikely. Then what happens, say the universe starts off not exactly supersymmetric, their brains, their anti-brains, and so on. Then what happens to the anti-brains? So D3 brains at the GKP level, they don't feel any force. The whole moduli space is a calabial. Of course, the moment you add in this correction, that's not true anymore. Also, those open string moduli are lifted. But what happens to an anti-D3 brain, it actually feels a, a gravitational and an electromagnetic force that pulls it down to the region of the highest warping. Okay? So it, the thing naturally goes to those tips. So it will be stuck here. So its open string modulus will be stabilized immediately. Okay? But once it's there, what is it doing? All right? So this is a good part. Let's go back. Yeah. Before you even had the Dante D3 brain, you had the flux conservation, so you have no number of D3 brain and oriented for the mass. Right. That was a super symmetric situation, no problem. Adding an extra brain changes brain, that pole. So you cannot do that. So you can add pairs. Exactly. And I wanted to exactly say that now. So let, let me check. Okay. You check whether my explanation is OK. So. What KKLT then said, and I, it will incorporate Gumrum's comment, I think, let's see, is they say, look, let's think about the new energy of this supersymmetry breaking effect. They say, well, the total potential will be the original ADS piece plus, and then there comes a factor of two times the warp down tension of my anti-brain. I hope everybody understands my notation. E to the 4A, E to the 2A is a warp factor that appears in the metric. T3 bar, I should probably use mu3, I'm not being consistent, is the tension of the anti-brain, okay? 
So why is there a number two? There are two ways of seeing it. One, as Kumrum said, is, OK, but this is going to upset the tadpole condition. But imagine bringing in a D3 anti-D3 pair. The D3 pair doesn't, is still, the D3 guy is supersymmetric with respect to the background. So it's not going to add energy. OK, supersymmetric. The anti-D3 will add energy. And then you can see why that's twice its DBI energy. No, because it's supersymmetric with respect to the background. Oriental charges negatively exactly cancel the D3 brain. That's the magic. Now, if you have three yeah. brains, you have to add the D3 brain energy. I'm saying that if I take a KKLT vacuum, let's forget about Susie breaking, and I put in D3 brains, yes. that, my, that I think that the cosmology constant doesn't change. I hope I'm not making a mistake. I, I know the tadpole condition changes. You, no, but. No, but, but I agree. But what happens is that the fluxes have to, you have to change the fluxes if you want to be able to do that. And the fluxes are positive energy. I, I agree. But um, so you change the fluxes. You actually have to lower them in order to satisfy the tadpole. You lose some energy, but that energy is compensated by the D3 brains. So this is why D3 brains don't add energy. I mean, from a field theory point of view, they don't break supersymmetry. Yeah. Supersymmetry. Everything is good. It's clearly we can add the D3 and D3 brain by force at two points. Then mm -hmm. add energy roughly the masses of each one. Twice. That's why I wrote two. Okay. So, so we are fine with that. Okay. Yeah. Let's continue. That, that, for that point, let's continue with that. Yeah. There is a point where you add them, they will start a different work factor. And in which position they are, the A will be different. But, the but look, this is a. This is a this is a thought experiment. If you don't like it, let me change it and go to my other explanation. Let me, yeah. Let, let me set up the question so that you answer it in the other context. Yeah. So we have a mechanism to try to get stabilized marginal in the following way by breaking supersymmetry in this way. Take a Calabria and take a cycle and let's say two cycles and wrap a D5 brain around it. Now, for example, Quiltic has many of these two cycles. You can wrap get a polymorphic one, a minimal one, wrap a D5 brain. Yeah. And then, but that violates it. Number. Add an anti-D5 brain in the same class, yeah. but separate. Yeah. So therefore, in fact, you can arrange it so that there are isolated spheres inside the quintic. If the cycle is like in this. In the same cycle. OK. You could say, OK, good. Now, analog of this warping and all that is taking the cycle and shifting it to 0, uh, or making it smaller, whatnot, and making the tension go down to 0. Fine. But there's a new moduli developed. The new module that you have not discussed before is the distance between these two spheres. Right. Which is going to cause the force. And I would like to hear the analog of that in your context. And I don't, I don't have it right away. The only thing I can say this was, or this is a, the, the argument of putting two brain anti brain pair. Maybe it is confusing, but it works perfect in a non compact setup. So let me then therefore not give it. So this was an argument by Malasena in a non compact setup, and you just discussed warp throats. And you say in the holographic setting. No, no, but I, get, I think even, I get your point. Even if you had frozen and the position, I, I gave you, a, I would say, a slightly better scenario than this. Yeah. In the sense that locally you couldn't move it around. In other words, that sphere that I was talking about could not no, be moved see, around. So even if fine. you stabilize the position of the three brain in the point you want, you introduce new moduli that you have not talked before. That's my question. Is sure, but maybe, could it, I, I agree, but could it be that you take down the thought experiment of Malasena to Sirius, where he says, OK, let me argue in the easiest way why it's a 2. The actual computation, which is actually not too difficult to do, is to say, no, I'm just adding an anti-brain. And I'm checking how my Ramon Ramon tadpole conditions are changed. This changes the energy. If you go through that, if you go through that computation, you exactly get the 2 here. No, even if you, I'm not worried about the 2. I'm just saying there's ah. new moduli. Where's the new moduli? There are new modules that wasn't a part of your original story. By putting the extra brain, you're introducing new modules. Yeah, the open string modulus, but it's very massive because it. No, no, it the so no, but that was a thought experiment. I don't want to take that too serious. Be okay, that's what I'm saying. That was just a thought experiment to argue for the two. Maybe it was a bit too quick. It definitely works in a non compact setting where this is the, the supersymmetry breaking energy in the dual field theory. Uh, but okay, I, I don't want to take it too serious. So if you have a problem with it, I'm willing to buy the problem. Okay, okay. That's all I'm saying. So where was I? So I argue for this. And then the main point of KKLT, which is actually very cute. Oh, yeah, I forgot the essential part. If you do the dimensional reduction correctly, you go to Einstein frame, etc. This is the dependence on the Kähler modulus. So what is on the beauty of the whole scenario 
is that this thing is very, very sharply peaked. Why? It's an instanton effect. In terms of canonical scalars, it's an exponential of an exponential. Okay. Um, whereas uh, this three-level ingredient, the anti-brain energy, is power law, but in terms of canonical scalars, it's a pure exponential. Yeah. You're going to say that you need to reduce the flux and get rid of the brain itself. No, no, no. I'm just discussing why I get the sitter. Are you going to come back to that? To the yeah. Yeah. Well, if not, uh, remind me. Because I think it's crucial, because at the moment people are still worried, and I, if I were not, not knowing this, I would now be very worried. That About the tadpole condition? No, I don't. Yes, I would be very No, but I just said, so you put in anti-brains, you change the tadpole, you change the positive amount of energy in fluxes, okay? And in fact, you can show that you get the extra amount of energy that you put in the fluxes is identical to the anti-brain tension. That's one piece of energy. The other piece of energy is the pure tension of the object itself. D3 brain floating around anymore. Uh, good point. So that's, the, yeah, exactly. You can, but then you have to make sure that positions are somewhere here, right? In the UV. But wait, because that's KKLMMT. I'm just saying, you put the anti D3 here, you can still contemplate there to be mobile D3 brains here. They will feel a force, they will be moving yeah. towards it, and that might give you brain inflation, okay? You can, you can also avoid that by changing the change flux. Time. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Exactly. I was doing this. I agree with you, Arthur. I, um, I, I agree with you. I just wanted to emphasize, because I know it's clear to you, but it's important that you can have a setting where there is no freely floating D3. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the thing is, you have a power law dependence, all right? So if you do the sum of, sorry, it goes like that. If you do the sum of these two, your potential looks like this. Exactly what you want. It goes to zero at infinity, corresponding to dynamical decompactification. Uh, and you have a deceiver vacuum here, all right? So what I'm going to do now for the rest of the talk, and I'm a bit behind on schedule, is I will uh, quickly review three modern, most modern sources of disagreement with this picture, okay? Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Even having a single anti D2 brain, the claim is that it does, does this. Not, not, you don't have to choose the number correct. Well, the, the, no, that's a good point. Sorry, I should have emphasized I'm forgetting things. It's crucial that this guy clearly comes with string scale energy. So usually it blows away everything, right? But that's why you have to make sure that you can reach it if it's strong enough. So the, the typical tuning that you do, the playing with numbers, is uh, choosing the values of the um, flux quanta on, on the cycles in the, in the throat. Because they will tell you about the size of the warping. Uh, you know, with this GKP equation that it goes like Z stabilized at exponential minus, you know, what is it, K over MGS, something like that. Okay, so you make sure that you change, that you take those flux numbers correctly so that it's warped down, so it's totally under control because it's a tiny uplifting energy. Well, tiny, it still has to bridge this gap, right? And that will be a problem later on. But then, yeah, that should be it, okay? Now, is it possible in that same scenario to break the supersymmetry without uplifting to disappear or not? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. So this should give a range of non susy ADS solutions. And then in the context of non supersymmetric ADS solutions, we know there should be instability. And that will be discussed. Good point, but I think ah, if you choose, yeah, no, but I know it. It is unstable, and this is not. So if you look at the potential, you would say, no, I don't see an instability in this direction. But the instability is known, and it's in another direction, say in this direction, <coughs> and that's the open string modulus, which actually makes the brain decay against the flux. So those non susy ADS are inconsistently um, unstable. So there's no worry there, I would say. Uh, OK. So here are three modern, or modern, sorry, most recent uh, pieces of criticism on this picture. Um, and I only really worked on one out of these three, but I'm doing a bit more these days. But we'll see. Other people can help me if I say something wrong. OK, the first. I find the most difficult, but it's the most big claim. And this is due to Sapsetti. He's been, I think he's been pushing this for a long time, but he finally wrote it down in a paper, which is nice to read, which appeared in 2000, last year. So it's called Supersymmetry Breaking by Fluxes. All right, and this I found the most difficult to sort of review his argument, but I'll try to give it a shot, okay? He's actually saying, well, forget about the anti-brain. I'm not going to discuss that. It's too complicated. He says, I disagree with step number one, well, step number two. And that's a whole framework for moduli stabilization. 
Why? Because, he says, you're breaking supersymmetry at tree level in GKP by fluxes. So we therefore have a non-zero W naught, right? This thing is non-zero. Then he argues, well, generically, you don't expect that the alpha prime corrections preserve the no-scale condition. And he always says it's actually at order alpha prime cube. But if that is true, then I don't have, so let me write it down, no scale broken, order alpha prime cube. But if that is correct, before thinking about quantum corrections, let me call alpha prime corrections classical, I have a runaway. I mean, the situation I have is this, OK? I just have a running solution. But if that is true, he's arguing, first of all, how do you expect that quantum corrections can compete with that running? That's his first question. And he argues, on the basis of dualities with heterotic mainly, that they will not. And that it's, in fact, an inconsistency of the, even the semi-classical reasoning that is being used. But then the other thing, he, and this is much more complicated even, he says, really, what do we mean by quantum corrections in the first place? Normally, in quantum field theory, you start expanding around what you think might be a vacuum. But here, you're expand, you expand. I mean, you're just in a runaway. OK, it's like non-equilibrium field theory. I don't know what the name of this thing is. What do you mean by an instant on? What do you mean by all these corrections? Okay. But his main point, where he has the strongest case, is saying that you know this is what's happening. Um, and he, have, he argues throughout the paper that the quantum corrections, if they're there, they shouldn't be able to compete with this running. Okay? So although the, his paper mainly focuses on the sitter, if you read what he says, he's disagreeing with the, super, the existence of the supersymmetric anti-the sitter vacuum. Okay. Is that related to the analysis to your objection? Well, the objection, well, it wasn't really an objection, but it, it would be different. That, that, that kind of um, CFT duals. If you have a family of solutions, mm -hmm. which really uh, is a family that goes all the way to the play large alpha charge, then you have to wonder uh, why we haven't constructed that on the CFT side. Here, I think it would be different because this would be an isolated. I mean, that was uh, not really an objection, but it'd be a little bit uncomfortable, this type 2A setup where you had an infinite sequence. Here, you don't have an infinite sequence. So, so there's no objection. In so there's no objection. But later on, maybe, and you have to correct me because I'm not a specialist on 3D CFTs, I have a proposal on why from the, it's not mine, but why on the CFT side you can actually see that you cannot get control to the sitter uplifting. But I will come back to it, and it has to do with super. No, I'm talking about the kind of ADS vacua that you need. In order to get a controlled uplifting, they will have a certain property. I'll come back to it, which is not known in 3D CFTs. But so if I mention it, you're always welcome to correct me. Sorry, may I? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, sorry, uh, sorry I, didn't I, 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 I want to emphasize that there is, a, in my opinion, a very simple objection to that objection. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, uh, the picture that you drew, this potential, this runaway, is of course correct. Uh, but the height of this potential uh, depends on W0. For generic W0, or the 1W0, CT is completely right. If, but if that's true, we should not even buy a large volume scenario. I'm just saying the implications of, of if you agree with SETI for order 1W0. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Put words in your mind. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. We'll discuss the other thing later. Okay. Yeah. If you want. This uh, is now can be applied to small W0. So if you forbid me to tune W0 small, then CT is right and KKT doesn't work. But let me allow to take this picture and tune W0 to be small. Yeah. That allows me to go in this potential to the left further than I expected. OK? Right. Because the coefficient is simply small. Yeah. Now, I go left, and there comes a point, because the coefficient is small, that this power flow term, the small coefficient, Competes with, with quantum correction. That you already wrote down. Yeah. At that moment, even including those alpha prime corrections, you still find the minimum that you originally yeah. wrote down. And so uh, I simply do not see uh, where the novelty is because this was clearly known yeah. to the yeah. Yeah. Small right? Right. So small that was a yeah, so I think what. Right. So it's crucial, maybe it's also Lily saying that it's crucial that this guy is small for KKLT. 
How do you know that? Because from the start, if you want to minimize this, then this has to compete with this. This is an instanton effect, which is very tiny. So the consistency of KKLT in the first place requires a double new knot is fine-tuned. And I agree with the intuition of Arthur. It's actually also a bit mine. But then, so I'm not here to defend SETI, OK? I, I know he spent a lot of time thinking about this. He argues that it's almost like choosing your time. So he would say, oh, you're in a non-equilibrium situation. You're rolling. And he just said, so calling it W not big or large depends on what time you're looking. Something like that in a time-dependent cosmological setting. So he would sort of say that at some time, your effective field theory argument breaks down, and this doesn't hold. But I don't understand it sufficiently, and I understand your argument. OK, so therefore, because I told you SETI, I found most complicated uh, set of objections. But nonetheless, I really want to defend the paper in the following. He is really good at giving dual statements of what he's saying. Right? He gives examples where you can see that the tower of alpha prime corrections cannot be truncated in examples which he knows and others know very well. So I suggest to really, I mean, to, to read the paper carefully. That's all I want to say about SETI. Okay? The second thing is where I worked on, and Yosef is a great specialist, and I would call it point B. I like to call it back reaction is 6D of anti-D3 brain. So 6D back reaction. And my last point will be four-dimensional back reaction. OK? And to show my unbiased nature, I'm actually going to claim, and Yosef will correct me tomorrow, I'm going to claim that the original problems pointed out are not there. OK? So this is a pro-KKLT argument. Um, but you'll see in the end that I still don't really have my hopes very high. Um, OK. So what is the problem here? How could this not go well? Uh, it could not go well. We should not just focus on this. There are many other directions that could be destabilized. Okay? And one possible direction is moduli, which are living on the antibrain itself. So what if the thing that I uplift with itself is unstable? Okay, then you would get a rolling. You would get maybe quintessence. I don't know. Okay? So how can that be? What is the dynamics of the uplift object itself? Well, the dynamics or its internal dynamics is called brain flux transitions or brain flux decay, right? And you have to be really careful that there is no perturbative decay between brains and fluxes. And naively, we have this belief that if brains decay against fluxes, this is always non-perturbative, goes with domain walls, etc. But that is not true, okay? Brains and fluxes can decay in a perturbative way against each other. This was pointed out by Katschu, Pearson, and Verlinde. Uh, a bit before KKLT. And if you like, KKLT, I mean, the, one of the backbones of KKLT is definitely the Kachu Pearson Berlin the scenario. So I will now try to argue that some of the problems that were being mentioned here, I think they're resolved. Uh, I don't say it's without problems. And I'm, I'm very interested to hear what Yossif will be saying tomorrow. OK. So let me quickly, before the break, try to get this point through. So brain flux decay, what is going on? Let's focus on the throat region alone. Okay, let's zoom in on the anti-brain itself, right? Let's look at the total charge that is living inside this warped throat. Okay, there's charge dissolved in fluxes, and then there is a charge of the anti-brain itself, right? So there is, here is a source term. So let me call the local flux here, let me give it capital K. It's the flux quantum of the H field. I'm using notation of Klebanov Strassler. This guy is an integer I call M. And this guy is an integer which is negative, which I call P. So from now on, little p is the number of uh, anti-D3 brains. OK? This number doesn't need to be 0 because I'm only in the throat. It is canceled in the UV of my compactification. All right. So but what is the thing now? This guy has opposite sign to this guy. So purely by looking at quantum numbers, there is nothing that forbids them to decay against each other. So what can actually happen? What can happen is that k goes down one unit to k minus 1. And then I end up here with m minus p. Sorry, m minus p. This is a positive number because m is large. Well, this is just my resettled fluxes. So what has happened actually? Okay, This is called brain flux decay. What has happened is one way of thinking about it is that out of this flux cloud, 
which has the charge of a D3 brain. So there, you can think of these flux clouds as smeared out D3 brains. What actually happened is that MD3 brains got materialized. Okay? These MD3 brains, they see these P anti brains, they decide to annihilate, and what is left over are M minus PD3 brains, and I'm in a supersymmetric state. All right? So this is just, of course, this is not a calculation. So let me show you just uh, the idea behind the calculation, okay? Um, and also to show you why it doesn't need to be non-perturbative. If you definitely you think in terms of instantons, but that doesn't need to be the case. And the physics behind this is the Myers effect, or brain polarization, as some people like to call it. All right. So what is going on? If you look at this warp throat at the bottom, there is a, a non-zero cycle, okay, of non-zero size, and we call it the A cycle. And in the case of chaos, it's a three-sphere, right? So what happens is that these anti-D3 brains, they sit here at the bottom of this three-sphere, right? What can happen is that these D3 brains, these anti-D3 brains, they puff or they polarize into NS5 brains that wrap these contractible cycles living on the sphere, okay? So what is now the physics? So don't forget, in the background, there is an H field. If you look at the orientation of the H field, the H field or the B field is pushing the NS5 brain upwards. Okay? But the NS5 brain has its own tension, its own gravity, and it wants to go down. So there is a balance of there could be a balance of forces. So what you can do is you can calculate the potential for the NS5 brain motion. Let me call the modulus psi. What is psi? Psi is the ordinary angle here, so psi is zero here and psi equals pi at the North Pole, okay? So if you calculate this guy by literally taking the DBI and the Vesumino, summing them together, it has the following structure. So it potentially does this. This is psi, okay? Here I don't want to write it because you shouldn't trust it too close to zero. So this only happens when P over M is small enough. So you really need to, to tune it, okay? But this is good, because KKLT in the first place, they wanted a small number of anti-brains, and then the back reaction should be sort of okay, right? But if P over M is bigger, then you, this is what happens, okay? So then brain flux decay is perturbative. But it's essential that this is a probe calculation. And you can always say, well, I'm using NS5 brains. Well, what is a probe in the first place? Okay, can I even trust my DBI in Vesumino of an NS5 brain? In fact, the way they derived those NS5 actions were by using S-duality of a D5 action, but then it means that you can only trust it at strong coupling and you're at weak coupling, okay? So, officially speaking, it was not allowed, the calculation, and they mentioned it in their paper, but I think the intuition is entirely, makes a lot of sense, all right? So what is the problem first pointed out by Yosef Benna and Gary Shu and their collaborators they actually were interested in going beyond the probe limit. And especially in the holographic context, when I send M Planck to infinity, and I just look at the throat, right, and my calabia becomes infinitely big, you can just, you're doing that because you want to isolate that decay channel. There should be a good supergravity solution, right? I mean, this is a trick to, to enforce yourself to, to be in a regime of a good supergravity solution. Um, and what has happened when they computed those supergravity solutions, they found the following problem. If they look at the following energy density that appears in the energy momentum tensor, so the three form fluxes squared, and then there's always an e to the minus phi in Einstein frame, they found that it's infinite, it diverges. But be careful, you would say, yeah, but wait, I have an NS5 brain, there's H flux, it should diverge but it diverges completely different, okay, and also in the wrong directions. So this then, this was in 2009, this started a big debate, okay, and I think it was mainly, I think maybe Yosef th thought differently about uh, maybe the singularity, I don't know, but the, the main thing we did with you people in Uppsala was to say, well, this, if that happens, you have a big problem. Why? Because it means that locally, so what is happening, how to interpret the singularity, this guy, as I said, has a different charge to this guy. So electromagnetically, these fluxes are being sucked towards the anti-brain because fluxes are dynamical. There can be gradients, and they just feel the force, and, and they go towards the anti-brain, okay? 
But if they clump too high, and definitely infinity clumps is mean that there's a huge clumping of fluxes, the B field locally becomes too big, and it always pushes you over the side. Okay? So our interpretation was, this thing is side of the hill. We are in such a situation. But when that happens, you also resolve the singularity. Because, you know, the fluxes start growing, and then the things start decaying, and you never reach infinity. So the real solution is time-dependent and rolling. But I came back to this, and I don't think it's true. And the first person to point out possible issues with this kind of reasoning was Polchinski and collaborators in 2015. And what Polchinski said, he said, OK, I don't want to think about supergravity. This is too complicated and ugly. He said, let me therefore stick to the case of a single antibrain. Admittedly, we had to take multiple antibrains in order to do supergravity. But we always make sure in our calculations that p over m was parametrically small. It should be fine. And then Polchinski says he had reasons using you know, renormalization, effective field theory, what, whatever. He says, OK, but I need to cut your singularity off at a string length, okay, away from the point of my source. And then he notices that, in that case, this number isn't high at all. So the fluxes never grow too large. So he reasons the thing is stable. All right? The thing I want to point out, and this is work we did in collaboration with the people in Amsterdam, that even in the very large P limit, okay, we were able to show that at least in the holographic setting where I decompactify my Calabial, there, is a, there should be a smooth solution. Or the usual obstruction is gone. And I maybe I, I think I can give that ID in two minutes before the break. So I just want to give it because I think it's very simple and cute. And it shows a lot of the physics. So what, what am I saying is that supergravity knows about KPV and doesn't speed out the singularity in the right limit. Okay? So how do you do this? This is based on a technique by Gibbons and Warner. And, but we extended it from black holes to brains. And I, would, I don't know how to call it. Let me call it brain smart relations. Okay? Brain smart relations. What you do is you can derive the following relation, that the SUSY breaking energy, which some people have called ADM mass in these, in these warped throats, it's sort of a generalization of ADM mass for a black hole, it has to be positive the moment you break supersymmetry. Okay? And actually has to equal two times the anti-brain tension. What you can show is that it equals the following formula. It equals the number C, which I will explain times the monopole anti-D3 brain charge. So M here stands for monopole. Three bar means anti-brain. Then there's another number, B, which I will explain, times QD5. The D stands for dipole charge, and the 5 stands for NS5. Okay? So what this is saying, these are chemical potentials. It says that the total SUSY breaking energy equals the charges in the game, which is a monopole anti-brain charge, a dipole NS5 brain charge. Remember, the NS5 is wrapping a contractible cycle. It doesn't have charge, only dipole charge. This is the guy. And what are these guys? These guys are the leading contributions to the potentials near the horizon of the brain. So if I would take C4, it goes like little c, epsilon 4, where epsilon 4 is the world volume of the anti-brain, plus corrections. So this is the behavior in the infrared. And then B6, that's the field being sourced by an NS5 brain, goes like little b times epsilon 6, which is the world volume of an NS5 brain, plus corrections. Okay. So what is now our observation? You need one more formula, and you understand the whole thing. The second formula we were able to derive is this one. It's little c e to the minus 10a. So what do you see? plus corrections. e to the minus 10a goes to infinity near an anti-brain. You can show that. So the way to not have a singularity is to take little number c equal to 0. That's the only way to do it. But all the papers that came before ours were not able to do it, put it to 0. Why? In their back-reacted ansatz, they never allowed for dipole charge. OK? So they always had this, because they suddenly put in, they didn't put in an ansatz of an NS5 brain. But if you put in the ion sets of an NS5 brain, you can have this to be non-zero, but you can consistently take this to be zero. Because this guy is 
giving you all the energy. So when this is zero, there should not be a singularity. That is completely true, Yosef. And nobody knows whether... There's a Heimer argument that you, know, you must have a singularity. Yeah. What it shows is that you, know, you don't have to have a singularity. It doesn't mean it's not there. You know what? Uh, that I agree on. Yeah. But I'm just saying that the original argument isn't there anymore. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, I have a question. Does it mean that if I right away uh, go to the NS5 brain at the stable point of KPV, and I try to look whether there's a flux attraction and singularity, that I don't find a singularity there? Well, it's what I would say, but Yosef says, okay, there is no proof anymore for a singularity, so maybe not look for one. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't know, I don't know how to calculate this, but. Consider the puffed up equilibrium of KPV and look at the flux attraction in that setting and see whether you find a problem of flux divergence near the puffed up. Sure. But it's, no, because I think it's very difficult. For example, one can show that even a buffed up configuration has a tachyon. So, you know, one can show all other things. I'll, I'll talk about it. At, yeah. And before, maybe we should. Did you interview Kramer by, I mean, uh, who was it on, on, the, on the KPV uh, by uh, Van der Schaar, uh, Yeah. Oh, that's a very interesting paper, but uh, the only thing that, that the paper, well, not the only thing, the paper's not about back traction. The paper is just trying to argue how you actually get the nilpotent description, which is the next part of my talk after the break. Uh, the only thing I should mention is a bit unfair. I mean, uh, I should give, give credit to the right people. I mean, we did the calculations, but it was Potinsky that noticed that we missed the term, which then turned out to be uh, essential. And I must also say that it was already Malasena and Dimarski that said a long time ago that probably if you can back correct the NS5, you might not run into these troubles. Okay. That's my final remark. <laughs> Last thing I want to talk about is a very intriguing paper that appeared uh, last year by the group in DESI, Westphal, Ratoladza, and Moritz. And here is a summary of their calculations. And it's a beautiful illustration of the swamp plant inequality, if it's correct. Okay, so what are they claiming? And I call this 4D back reaction of the anti-brain. So you have to contrast it with the 6D back reaction. They're saying this, okay? This is a KKLT potential in white. I do some supersymmetry breaking. You know, I can actually get to ADS, no problem. But the moment that you want to be, it to become positive, it's exactly the moment you start rolling. So in that sense, it's a beautiful um, illustration of the swamp plant conjecture. Okay. Um, so how does this come about? All right. And for the rest of my talk, I, I switch. I see my notes. I switched notation. So now rho is I times T. It's still the single killer Calabria. So there are, the, the paper has three kinds, two kinds of arguments. Either the argument is purely intendi, and then they always try to interpret it in terms of four-dimensional effective field theory. Okay? So the most rough problem they point out with KKLT is the following one. They say, well, the uplift that you need to go to the sitter has the following. So let me call that delta V. It's the thing you need to bridge. They say, well, here's a the problem, they say. Delta V in KKLT is of this order. M squared rho, which is uh, the, the mass of the volume modulus, times M plank. And they say, so whenever you cannot disentangle these two, uh, separate these two scales, you have a problem with shifting the modulus. Why? Because it means that the way, how wide this potential is, the moment you start, you know, Disturbing it, you can actually, you'll be shifting your vo volume modulus position. It is okay if this, you know, if the mass would be much, much bigger, right? So this is the general problem they point out, but they have a lot of calculations to back it up, right? So the paper is really impressive. Um, that's what I'm going to explain, yeah. Um, all right, so this is a general picture. I hope you have understood that. Um, the second thing they do is they try to make it very concrete, okay, in a 4D way. So the way they make it concrete in 4D language and not 10D yet, I will come to the 10D, is by using the nilpotent superfield description of Kellosh and company. They say, okay, let's assume that that's correct. So here is what they do. They say, well, if you use that prescription, 
Then the superpotential depends on rho and after integrating out the complex structure moduli, it depends on the killer modulus, but also now on this nilpotent superfield. So we have that S squared equals zero. Okay. And the thing that Kalosh and company wrote down was this A, where A is the instanton determinant, or you know, the Gagino condensate squared, or the dynamical scale, e to the minus A rho plus square root of the warp down tension times S, and then the killer potential is minus three log rho plus rho bar minus S, S bar, okay? So Kellogg et al, they have shown that if you do this, you use the potency, et cetera, you calculate uh, the scalar potential in terms of rho, you, you find the, K, the KKLT potential, right? So what is the point now of Moritz et al? They say this, well, wait a minute. If you think about what happens to D3 to D brains, if you have mobile D3 brains, well, mobile D3 brains come with their own moduli, which are called Z, you know, their positions inside the Calabiao. It is known and computed that the instanton determinant you will, depend on, will depend on it. Okay, this is what stabilizes uh, D3 brain moduli. But if that is correct, they say, also anti-D3 brain moduli should appear in that guy. Okay, but that's, you know, how to compute that? Well, if you integrate out that modulus, it means that there should be an S dependence in that instanton determinant, but it's an important field, so there's only one possible dependence. So what they do is they say they, ch they take this, and they just replace A by A plus C times S. Is, I mean, there's only one order correction. There's not an S squared. And then the question, is, then what they observe is this. If C is not warped down, and they have an argument for that, then you exactly see this. That's exactly what happens. Okay? So now the whole debate is, if you believe this formalism of the nilpotent, if you buy it, um, you have to explain why C is not warped down, okay? Um, I will explain why that is, uh, but before, let me just make some general comments. So this C, you should really regard as an operator uh, that couples the UV with the IR, okay? There's a UV, IR, they talk to each other, okay? Um, and this is the thing that I don't know what I was asking, maybe one way of seeing it is that the, there is a force between the, the seven brains and the O-planes in the UV and the, the bottom of the throat, basically. It's a geometry, almost, that wants to adjust to it, okay? All right, so what is their argument for it? There are two arguments, and I, well, let me give the easiest one. That's the 10D calculation. And then they, so the 10D calculation, the problem with the way they present their 10D calculation is that you lose all intuition. Okay, and they agree on it, but that's, that's what it is. And then you always try to interpret it in 4D effective field theory. So let me give the 10D calculation, or just sketch it, because it's a very tough one. Um, so here is, they follow a proposal by many people, and I don't know the exact names, I think it's McAllister, Klebanov, Dimarski, Martucci, Kerber, many people that say, well, one way to understand KKLT from a 10D point of view, the supersymmetric one, is by the following proposal, which works remarkably well, okay? So you can actually understand the Gagino condensate in 10D. You take the, the D7 fermionic action, and you keep all fermion bilinears. And you take them non-zero. Okay? You just do that, and then you go through your 10D calculations, a la GKP. You just do it, and you trace back the effect of this. Okay? Um, so this doesn't mean that you're deriving gauge condensation in a classical way. You're assuming there is gauge condensation, and you want to understand how gauge condensation sources closed strings, how they back react. And the proposal is the way they back react is by taking the supersymmetric D7 action, keeping the fermions at bilinear level, and making that non-zero and go through the calculation. And that seems to work. It seems to have a lot of non-trivial consistency checks, especially in the supersymmetric case. So they just say, okay, let's also do it non-supersymmetrically, all right? So what happens if you do that calculation? Um, and I'm just going to sketch it. And I have to introduce some notation, as always, when you do supergravity. So let me write an equation and then talk about the consequences of that equation. And I need to explain all the symbols in my equation, OK? So that's what I'm doing now. But then you see the problem immediately. 
And then we're going to interpret it in field theory. Well, the details are not important, but somehow I feel I need to write them. Plus e to the 2a delta log. OK, let me explain each symbol. Uh, those familiar with GKP might know the symbols already. So phi minus, I think, is uh, alpha minus e to the 4a. I have to explain alpha. If you look at C4, then it is alpha times epsilon 4. So alpha is some function on the internal manifold. Okay, That's the answer for C4 in, KKLT, in GKP. R4 is the Ricci scalar in four dimensions. Uh, this is just a d of phi. This is a warp factor. This is my anti-self-dual piece of my three-form fluxes. And this is a crucial guy. This is all of the sources, the localized source contributions. OK, so these are, if you like, integrals over delta functions. And what is crucial to know is that in GKP, this is 0. Because these are these guys that vanish whenever you use a BPS bound. OK, I'll, I'll come back to that. So let's first do GKP in order to sort of understand these equations. So what did GKP do? They had, did not have this guy in their ansatz. Um, they, did, they showed that this is 0. OK? So then they take an integral. They say, well, this is a total derivative. So I get 0 on this side. And then they say, well, the only way this can work is if g minus is 0. That's the IZ condition. And if alpha equals e to the 4a, and that's a standard expression for a d3 brain. Okay, so that's a supersymmetric solution if the g flux is of the right kind. Okay, so what happens now for KKLT anti the sitter? Okay, what happens? Again, this guy is zero. This we don't know. We leave it there. This is strictly positive definite. This is positive definite. All right, and so what happens is that you can show that. It's the sum of these three guys that is positive, right? And then, indeed, this has to be negative to compensate. This is how you derive KKLT from a 10 point of view, the supersymmetric one. OK, now comes the clue of the calculation. And probably I should spend some more time explaining it, but it's actually quite, it's not so difficult, OK? What you do now is you add the anti-brain into this guy. And what is super surprising? The piece in here that is anti-brain, let me write it d log purely the d3 contribution, is even positive itself. So, I mean, the only way that it can bring you to the sitter is by this, that you suddenly say, well, this delta log had two contributions. OK? There is a piece in the UV, which are the orientifolds, d7 brains, etc., And then there's a piece in the IR, which is the anti-brain. But that guy is positive. Okay? So the only way that you can get at the sitter is if you say, well, the back correction of this guy has to be so strong, it has to crawl all the way out of the throat to change this guy's value so strongly that you suddenly can flip the sign. Okay? But that goes against believing that the anti-brain back correction is okay. All right? I mean, I'm sketching a long calculation. I'm making it very simplified, but this is sort of the yeast of the calculation. All right? So, all right, so that sh just shows you this can never work, right? But then you can wonder, but hey, then I don't even believe in these guys, in these ADS, right? Because why? It shows that adding anti-brains only makes that term more positive, would make that term more negative. But that is not true. And they explain very well how that happens. The way it happens is that exactly, so the, the, the real change in the energy is not due to this contribution. It is due to the way the volume readjusts by adding in anti-brains. And the volume goes up. Uh, sorry, you go, you go to this side. And this is how you lower the energy. OK? So therefore, the, the interpretation is <coughs> non susy ADS is possible, but there's no way you can actually get to the sitter. Right? Do they compute the, uh, I mean no. That, that's what you could call the off-shell potential. They don't know how to compute it. No, but the only, the only reason, if you check all the assumptions, the only thing that then should break down is that it was a static answer. So it has to be rolling, right? And I think it's I, I, I have a comment now. I think, I think the right moment to make a So I have a very, very critical, in my opinion, important comment. So uh, there are technical problems with the calculations that you mentioned, which I am considering, I will consider further. 
I will not want to go into that. I don't think it is a, a consistent and reliable candy calculation. But let, it, let me even assume it were such a calculation. The logic, in my opinion, is not sufficiently convincing to, to doubt the Ford effective theory. For a very, very simple, clear reason. Everybody knowing effective field theory should see where the logical error is. A genome condensate is a non-perturbative quantum effect happening at a low energy scale. That energy scale is far below the cruiser Klein scale. So once you have introduced this effect, you cannot, in principle, expect that you can take that expectation value, say lambda lambda bar, for example, as a constant, pack it back into the equations of motion in 10D, and hope to resolve for a new 10D geometry. That is inconsistent, because the effect is a low energy effect, and you cannot go back and expect to resolve that in 10D. This is just yeah. turned the wrong way around. I'm not saying that there is not a 10D geometry, and one cannot ask about the geometry. But this requires a much more careful, careful and deep analysis, including like life is a Casimir energy or something like that. You need to think what the energy momentum tensor is, which scale to average, or etc. etc. You cannot, in principle, hope to go back to 10D with an effect that's a 4D long scale effect. Okay. So maybe it's time for me to write down before I continue, the possible sources of criticism. And it's good that Arthur mentions one. So you say, no, 10D calculation is simply not allowed. Second source of criticism, and that's what, what Arthur is trying to explain. Um, C should be warped down. No, no, I was actually more the first one. I have a comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the third piece of criticism, that's something my colleagues in Leuven are working on, is that there are, in fact, the UV divergences in the calculation. So the, here there are integrals. The moment you turn on a gauge genome condensate, these things blow up if you go into the ugly details. But then you need to cut it off. And my point is, I mean, it's nice that my colleagues are doing this. I think it's really important to get it right. But this will not influence at all the conclusion here. OK? So there is a tiny mistake in that paper, but it will not you can clearly see it cannot influence the thing. So I would say this is not a real criticism. It just means we need to do work harder and do it better. OK. So to quickly comment on Arthur's uh, thing, I don't have a strong opinion. I would just say this. It perfectly works in the supersymmetry case. OK. That has been shown by many people. OK. Uh, and maybe we should not have the long debate now. There's a lot I still want to say. Um, even though it's an effect that it's out, you know, it's far below the KK scale, it's the same as saying, okay, what if you know quarks confine? We talked about so if quarks confine, it's a strongly coupled gauge theory effect. Nonetheless, I can put that in my energy momentum tensor and calculate how quarks back react on the geometry. So the only thing they're doing here is to say, okay, it confines is a lot of complicated IR physics, but the way it sources closed strings is captured by the ten-dimensional supergravity, and that I actually intuitively would agree on. But I'm not a big expert, so I could easily be wrong. Um, because the, the size of the Gehino condensate actually depends on the size of the cycle. Yes. Which is the dynamic and which you recreate. So it's yeah, that's how they actually compute the, the dependence. Right, but you, but you, but you, you solve in 10 equations of motion, which are here not just, I mean, it's, it's different having, having a constant condensate everywhere. So maybe I should say that this then will be the main source of criticism that might appear on the archive uh, at some point. I hope that the KKLT people themselves might say something about this. OK. So the argument of the authors on, on how this can actually be understood from a effective field or effective field theory sort of in between 10D and 4D is to say, how can this happen, right? Because naively, you would say C is a little number that comes from the SUSY breaking. So it should be warped down, because that's where the SUSY breaking happens. So how can you understand that it's not, all right? And also, I mean, I'm not, well, let me make it C not warped down, question mark. So first of all, the 10 calculation, if you are willing to agree with it, shows that it, it must be, OK? It must not be warped down, because you don't get the sitter. Another way of thinking about it, what actually happens, is that it's a gay geno condensate. So the authors really strongly insist on the D3 not back reacting strongly, the anti-D3, right? 
So its back reaction just dies off very quick when you go from the IR to the UV. But they say this. Well, they say, if you think about a gaugino condensate living in the, living in the UV, that guy is actually going to back react, is going to blue shift to the IR. OK, and you can sort of naively guess how does this blue shift work, right? Well, you just add in the warp factors. It's an inverse warp factor, OK? And here comes the whole point, which I started with. Let's evaluate that, and you will see that this is the problem you hit. Let's evaluate this. Well, this is order one. It's trivial to see. Why? It's basically, this is the gap, um, this is the gap energy. This is this delta V, right? So we know that delta V equals P times e to the 4a. That's the uplift energy. I mean, I need to go to the sitter, right? So P is order 1. So this guy is order 1. OK? So the argument is the tip geometry is altered by an order 1 effect. And this is how the UV talks to the IR. It's not that the anti-D3 is crawling out. No, it's more that the UV is back reacting on the IR. OK? So the real issue is this one. And then I want to end by giving two interesting comments, uh, which I think should be considered in the Swamp Plant program. So if you think about this, uh, so even if you, if you agree with Arthur, which could, he could be very well correct that you cannot do the 10D calculation, you should always, as an EFT person, be worried about this. If delta V is of the same order as the lightest uh, mass scalar, you have no control, and the things can shift, and you don't know how they will shift. Okay, the main argument of Westphal and France is that they shift in such a way that you cannot get the sitter. No control, I disagree. I mean, I agree that there's, there's little control. But if you have uh, the potentials of both terms, I mean, the, the ADS and the, and the uplift term, yeah. who, why is it incorrect to minimize the negative theory? Because they, this argument, all of this says it's the, the KKLT potential is not the sum of one, the ADS, please, plus the SUSY breaking. It's not a sum. That's what they, because the UV, this is the ADS part, talks to the IR, which is, okay, that's true. I agree, if you have a handy argument, which goes wrong, they can be right. Right. I disagree with the argument, but fine. Okay. I don't see that your point one, the missing scale separation, is a fundamental objection. I mean, it's true that it's a more fine-tuned situation than you would hope for, but I don't see an argument why it is wrong. Okay. I would love to comment, Arthur, but I, need, I want to say my, okay. So here are some swamp plant, I wouldn't call them conjectures. These are quite clear observations, okay, which haven't been made before, I think. So if you want to, imagine this. Imagine that somebody in string theory finds an ADS solution, supersymmetric, ADS, with the following property. The lightest mass scalar, it's much heavier than the scale set by ADS. What does it mean in intuit intuitive words? The thing is very sharply peaked, very sharply peaked, and you can tune it to zero from below. Such a potential, the moment you add SUSY breaking, by the, it should give a metastable the sitter, right? Because there's no way you can jump out, OK? So imagine such ADS vacua exists. There should be the sitter, metastable the sitter vacua in string theory. In a, so I'm saying if you can do this parametrically, meaning I send this to zero and I make sure this is much bigger always. And if I can do this parametrically, there should be metastable the sitter vacua. Any SUSY breaking, no matter what, where it comes from, will give you a metastable the sitter. And I'm saying I can show these things are in the swamp plant, right? Or I have arguments. And one argument is. Um, a paper I wrote with one of the authors, with Jakob Moritz, and we say, okay, let me give us a stringy derivation of such an ADS vacuum. Well, one, one existed. It was due to Kalos and Linne, and appeared after KKLT, and they say, well, they sort, I think they sort of also had this in mind, say, well, let's consider a racetrack, meaning that I have two D7 stacks, and my gauge group is a factor. It's SU1, SUN1, times SUN2. OK? And then you can show that if you take n1 very close to n2, and you make both of these guys very large, you end up in this situation. OK? But what did we show? The moment 
we look at the axionic partner of this guy, that's exactly when its decay constant in Planckian units becomes of order n, so it's parametrically large. This is selling, there is something bizarre about this, okay? The other argument, which is uh, an ID I got here, and I was hoping, for, well, I guess there's CFT specialists in the audience. I, I asked this to my colleague, Nikolai Bobev. He said, what, what about, you know, is there a general thing known in, in 3D CFTs that such ADS vacua cannot exist if they have holographic dual? What would be the, holog oh. what would be the holographic dual to this statement, to the existence of such ADS vacua? These would be 3D CFTs, and even supersymmetric ones, so which have the following property. There's not a single low-lying operator dimension. Why is that? Just recall the formula that the operator dimension, some, well, 3 over 2, I guess, plus square root um, 9 plus 4 m of the scalar. So I'm talking about the operators dual to the lightest scalars times L of ADS squared. So what I'm asking is that this guy goes to infinity because I want to reach vacuum energy to zero from below. This guy stays finite. Okay, so this becomes huge. So this thing is huge for the lightest scalar. So for the operator with the smallest dimension. So these are, must, there must then, if you believe in such vacua, there must exist CFTs without a single uh, even a relevant operator, right? Now, I know basically nothing about CFTs, so it's a question if somebody knows whether these things exist, but if, if it's somehow known that this cannot be, it would rule out such ADS vacuum. And then I think I basically said what I wanted to say. So it's time for my final remarks. Um, what did I want to say? Maybe I just wanted to say that I think it's important to, to sort of investigate KKLT, and I would say that the ideas behind it are extremely smart and beautiful, but it doesn't mean they are correct. Um, it's some, I mean, there's, once you start digging in, you see many possible things that can go wrong, and the, re the reason I personally became what you could call a deceiver denialist is exactly because of things like this. Whatever you can think of to make it parametrically under control, you hit a problem. Right? So it's always there. The sitter should always be hiding there where we don't fully, you know, can not fully describe it. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say, that imagine you believe that the sitter is in the swamp land and quintessence is not the only way. Um, I'm not the greatest expert in cosmology, but I am still told that there's a serious group of cosmologists that believe that spatial inhomogeneities, which when average out, can behave like dark energy or even just the structure of voids can make you think you see dark energy. So it's still a possibility that there is no dark energy whatsoever, not in the form of a cosmic constant, neither in the form of quintessence. You would still need to solve the CC problem, but we shouldn't be looking for the Citra vacua or quintessence in string theory. Um, and then, of course, there are the quantum IR effects by Polyakov, Motola, and many others, which are also pointing to the fact that the Citra doesn't exist. And so I just want to end with a personal uh, conjecture, which is not in the form of a paper, but I thought, why not here? And that's my final comment. Um, what if, so I would say that theories, this is a conjecture, this is not, doesn't need to be true. The theories that obey this inequality, this is the BF bound for the sitter space. So this is L the sitter. The theories that obey this, would also be theories where the holographic dual to the sitter space would only have real uh, operator weights, that such theories can have stable the sitter. I'm not even talking metastable, I'm talking fully stable, and even supersymmetric. And a theory like that, you know, it's Fazilia theory. That's exactly the only kind of theories where a holographic dual has been constructed of the sitter space, and it nicely obeys this. Okay, and the fact that you can supersymmetrize it, we have given very strong evidence in a recent paper uh, with the people in Leuven. Um, and my guess is, so string theory clearly is a theory where there are many states which violate this, 
I'm wondering whether this could be the analog to the weak gravity inequality, where if this happens, you can actually show that the sitter horizon becomes unstable due to pair creation. That was basically the final thing I wanted to say. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I want to make a more general comment. Yeah. So uh, I think you're doing here something that is very dangerous and can backfire and hurt us all. Namely, we are uh, throwing away on the basis of some arguments which are interesting and important and should be considered, we are throwing away uh, mentally KKLT and LBS and, and co. Okay? So uh, uh, already now, people outside our community or half outside our community are referencing this as theorems and truths. They reference Kumro and they reference a best file and they are saying it is known theorem that the sitter can be not realized in string theory and that everything that is said so far is wrong. So now that's fine, maybe that's more controversy, more interest. Uh, given that Kumrun and co. succeed in constructing alternatives, I mean, well-defined, as well-defined at least as KKLT or better, alternatives with quintessence at Cumbria and so on. But these alternatives at that level of detail do not yet exist. If you fail to do that... Sorry, I don't agree with that, but the quintessence is very simple to construct. I don't know what you mean. A string, a string compatibilization with a standard model and they can get the standard model. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's be fair in terms of options. But okay. I think that, uh, first of all, I think your, your statements are uh, inflammatory. Let's just calm down. Uh, first of all, we're talking about constructions that uh, have been viewed as a given fact in the community. That's which a is already the first mistake. I think no. our community should not have embraced KKLT without as much criticism as well. So, and I think the reason is not because we didn't want to be rigorous or something, is because we believe that nature should have this there, because it was observed. So I think part of the lack of uh, enough criticism was because we wanted to be true. I think, on the other hand, when in the literature you see people claim their 10 to 600 back already established as from as a voice from our community, where we have controversies, we not be, um, goes on and on, that's bad for us. We are making a statement which we are not sure about, making such a claim in the literature and then it's bad for it in the public. In the general public, it's bad for a community. I agree. So we should we should I, be I, I, we should be that. criticizing I, 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 at the same time as trying to see if it's correct. I think I the attitude that. of saying it's wrong or right this early. I wouldn't say that. I don't know why people say I say that. I, I don't know. My statement, in fact, the point of this conjecture is to evaluate whether it's true or not. I agree. More seriously, and people have abandoned evaluating this question as much. And the very small community, which I think we hear about. But by and large, people were not asking questions whether we have example of the reliable consider. Instead, they were counting 10 to 600 they exist, even if they haven't constructed one reliable one. So to me, that was, that was the main issue. And I think these points of these conjectures, not to say we are wrong or right, as, as people, I think we don't think we should inflame it. We should understand it. We should try to see to what extent we have control over the calculation. That's what science is. I, I don't, I don't no, know we, your objection. We, we here in the room agree. Uh, on that, what you just said. And I, I, well, I, I think that as scientists, we should do what, what we think. I, I think that that's our, our task is to understand what we're doing. I'm not, I don't care how people perceive us. I think our, our work is to understand. Well, uh, may, may, sorry, may I, may, you interrupted me. May I finish whatever I want to say? You can. Uh, maybe for you in the US, it's fine at Harvard. For me, it will be a pain because, because people will turn, or, turn against me, and this is the little stand that string theory and new physics at all has in Germany will be harmed by, uh, by a backlash on us that we have been talking nonsense all the time, which is not true. We have our disputes, we have different opinions, we investigate this, but it's dangerous that this will come across that string theory is, has now established that KKLT and LBS are wrong. Which Who, is said that? Who said that? Who said that? Today's paper by uh, uh, Brandenberger, Lavinia Heisenberg, well, Butler. But it's not our fault, so, right? So, First of all, okay, let's, let's, I think as a community, I think we're more mature. If your friends give you a hard time, they may give you a hard time either way. So that's, I, don't that's, think, that's, that's, I don't think because of your friends we should decide the fate of string theory. <laughs> so I think you deal with your friends as you, as you prefer. But I think as far as I, our community is concerned, I think we should have better evidence of KKT existence or not. It is a shame we don't have a construction of it which is simple. I agree. And I'm not asking of a vacuum with energy 10 to the minus 122. I want asking of energy 100 of time. 
one thousandth of time. Not ten to the minus. Give me one example. I don't care if it's in four dimensions. I want nine dimensions, eight dimensions. Give me an example. So the statement that we have not come up with reliable examples in our community is what's the problem, and I think we should work in that direction. Trying to trying to attract attention in that direction, whether your friends give you a hard time or not, I think they will give you a hard time regardless. I think probably they will find other other way to give you a hard time. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be saying that we are certain it cannot be done. Who that? says? Who, but none of us has said that. that. We never said that. We never we never, never said that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't criticize it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't criticize it. I agree. I agree. I agree. So, we should, we should so I think I think you should deal with your friends. I think more than more than our community. Our they're community. Not my, they're not my friends. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to. They're all friends. So I'm just saying that the community should not be too excited. I think not we should calm the visitors. My friends. People who believe that middle stable visitors are like KKLT or other forms exist, they should come up with better arguments. Maybe they are right. I, I certainly would welcome such arguments if they can come up with it. On the other hand, maybe there are no good things that they cannot exist, and that's also fine. I agree. I, I agree. think this idea that we cannot, uh, that there's a sacred spot because we have kind of it announced to the community, this is what we have said, it's bad for us to say that, that's dangerous. What you're saying, I think, would be more dangerous than this, to be worried about criticizing. But in fact, also the opposite happened, right, Arthur? Yeah, I didn't say what you, what you said as well. Well, you said it would be very dangerous what you are saying. I think, I think it's dangerous. The, I didn't know that the city cannot be realized. Yeah, but the opposite happened, and actually it backreacted very badly. We had a book by Voigt and Smolin, and it was based on the existence of the multiverse as a correct statement, right? And that's when the criticism on string, string theory took off, right? And now, if this is, you know, if there's no decider, it's potentially interesting because there's a measurable effect. We can, we can actually measure the variation of the equation of state parameter of dark energy, right? So that it's way better. Um, so I think it's far more predictive than KTLT. It's true. If, if, if indeed the metal state of the state does not they exist, it's good news in terms of connecting string theory with experiments, for sure. For sure. I, I, think I, I have another comment, I guess, I guess maybe a response. Since, you know, Thomas and I have been at the receiving end of all these comments that, you know, we are against string theory because we try to disprove string theory and so on. We are just string theory doing our job. I mean, you know, I'm a string theory set of calculation. There's an equal to equal signs, and hopefully not, you know, hand waving and so on. There's a number, and you know, if I compute a number, and you know, the number could be at the beginning of the calculation either pro KQT or against KQT or in some vague area, and the number comes out to be against KQT. And you know, it happens once, it happens twice, it happens three times. You get angry emails from people who are pro KQT telling you to stop working on the field because otherwise the rest of them supposed to not get the job, <laughs> and as I did, uh, it happens. Uh, and then you know, the calculation, the calculation is correct. No, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to think sociology and so on and so forth. We cannot hide the truth. I mean, if the truth is there. I mean, if this thing doesn't work, it doesn't work. There's a calculation with equal signs, which you can sit down and do. If the calculation is wrong, okay, I don't understand why it's wrong. But I think it's stupid to just silence a point of view, which is correct physically. We're not lying. We're not trying to put a facade to the community we are doing this, we are doing that. We're trying to find the truth. If the truth is there, we'll find it. You know, you calculate and you find it. If the truth is not there, it's not there. I think that's the way we should behave as scientists. We are not, we're not doing a pop. And I think the main problem is that at the beginning, people in the KQT camp, they came with like, okay, string theory has the multiverse, we don't need to do physics anymore, and tropic principle, they came up with all these, with all these ideas, which hurt string theory much, much worse, at least in Europe, at least in my part of Europe. And, you know, essentially it hurt us heavily. And then, you know, as you know, Thomas was saying, all the about all, all this, uh, void and small information, <coughs> they basically were, uh, were very popular. Sorry, sorry, I, 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 sorry. I, I did not say that we should, not, if KKT turns out to be wrong, mm -hmm. it's wrong, period. That's yeah, what no, I said. But you so I think people are just swinging on, on the other side. You know, people for a while, they, they tried to say, oh, you know, we know 10 to the 500 vacuum are right. Now they are saying, oh, you know, no vacuum is right. right. Popular That's culture true. is popular culture. You know, it's that people are just... Well, I, th I, think, I think we should be careful. I mean, the one we have to say what we think is correct. And the people who are careless, that's their problem. I mean, we cannot, we cannot, uh, we cannot be, but I think in our community, the strength of our emotion, I think, is bad for the subject. Pro KKFP saying this has been doing on this, like this. They are, I think, as much, they are, in my opinion, as much right. making error as those who say we can prove they cannot be honest and not be right because of right. these issues. So I think, I think that, I think that uh, we should be calm, a little bit more calm in terms of it's, uh, the usual scientific mode. I think that's, that's what's departing, I think. In this kind of discussion, I think we are the part of the discussion today and the tomorrow is precisely to bring a little bit of a calm kind of evaluation. And like today's discussion, we hear the pros, the cons, and you know, it's that's the way it should be. Science is like this. So. Absolutely. Any question about an equation? <laughs> <laughs> any other yes, questions? I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
So uh, if, if that is true, and we always have this, this uh, say, uh, very flat or, or rolling situation, I'm still concerned because, because I, I don't know how you're going to deal <coughs> with the large amount of ZUSI breaking, the uplift that is there simply because I am in the non ZUSI standard model. There seems to me to be this extra on top which forces me to, uh, to, to stabilize more strongly than according to your notes possible. The standard model itself contributes to the constant positively and much higher than our little plus uh, that we measure. So I'm concerned about how this interacts. No, but that's the thing I said in the beginning. If you can engineer the standard model by having some D7 stacks somewhere else in the UV, yeah. then normally the way you should do your moduli stabilization, you should just redo everything. You don't have this simple, where is the KKLT potential? There is much more. There's also open string moduli. You need to stabilize those. And then you can think of adding anti-brains. But then you dec de decouple the two. Any other questions? Thanks for an exciting discussion. Thank you.